pleasure to have the chance to, uh, to welcome you all here today. My name is Kate Moncrief. I'm the chair of the English department and the chair of the Sophie Kerr Committee. And this is the 44th year we are, have awarded the Sophie Kerr Prize. And I couldn't be more excited that we're, we're, we moved to New York and we're doing it here. I want to introduce a few people who are present in the audience, some other members of the English department who sort of made the mass journey from Chestertown up here. Uh, professors Rich and Barbara Gillen are in our front row. Professor Mooney is here with me on the podium. Professor Corey Olson back there in row three. Professor Kathy Wagner. Um, Professor Jean Dubro is back in the back. And Professor Mark Nowak, who is our director of the Literate House, is back in the back. I want to bid a special welcome as well to, we have several former Sophie Kerr winners here, and I hope we have a few more on the web virtually, so I'll say hello to all the Sophie Kerr winners, but we have last year's winner, Haley Reisman, Liam Daly, 07, Claire Tomkin, 05, Catherine Degentesh, 95, and Patrick Adamasi, 92, I think that's right, so thank you all for turning out for this. I have a couple thank yous. People have worked very hard to make this a wonderful occasion. First of all, President Reese for suggesting this, as well as um, his staff has been absolutely amazing. Meredith Padaway, Kay McIntosh, Laura Wilson, Brian Palmer, Nancy Cross, and we've had a, a few board members pitch in, Dr. Mark Schulman and, and Mrs. Judy Copeland, who helped out to get this venue. So thank you to everyone who made this possible. Uh, it seems fitting to me that I take just a moment of your time to tell you a little bit about Sophie Kerr, whose generosity and legacy makes today's event possible. She was born on the eastern shore of Maryland in 1880 and earned a bachelor's and a master's degree at a time when neither were common for women. She purchased 115 East 38th Street here in New York and lived there from 1920 until her death in 1965 at the age of 84. Over the course of her 40-year career, she served as managing editor of Woman's Home Companion, published 23 novels, 500 short stories, numerous articles in the most popular magazines of her day, including Collier's and the Saturday Evening Post, saw a play she wrote run on Broadway, saw it made into a movie. For anyone who's looking for it, it's 1934's Big Hearted Herbert, run right out to Netflix. <laughs> she was a successful independent woman, and she supported herself on her earnings. She was a voracious reader and an industrious writer who took as her subject matter everything um, from love and romance to cookery and cats. My personal favorite Sophie Kerr book is called The Best I Ever Ate. So if you're looking for some great Eastern Shore recipes, pick that one up. In 1941, Kerr published an essay called Maryland's Eastern Shore in Home and Garden Magazine, which apparently featured uh, many of the mansions and fine homes of the Eastern Shore. And I'd like to share just a paragraph with you that she wrote about the Eastern Shore. She says, if you have not had the luck to be born on the Eastern Shore, you cannot know its people. You may know the fruitful country of wide level fields laced by silver tidewater rivers and creeks. You may know the woods of pine and oak and sweet gum with their undergrowth of laurel and sassafras, and in low-lying spots, the sweet-scented, exquisite little magnolia blocka. You may know the excellent roads and sandy, rutted shortcuts and back tracks. You may know the towns with tree-shaded streets and comfortable front porches where soothing rocking chairs invite the guest. You may know the great mansions of past and present, some of them with faces lifted by northern cash money. You, you may read the newspapers and do business in the banks and get your mail at the post office and go to the card parties and eat the superb crab salad and chocolate cake. But nonetheless, if you are not born there, you will not truly know the people. You will like them. You will enjoy their unconscious, perfect resistance to neurotic pressure. But now and then, you will find yourselves amazed and baffled and even devastated by a glimpse of what lies beneath their calm and friendly exteriors. <laughs> so I'll leave you with that Sophie Kerr teaser. <laughs> Although three of Sophie Kerr's novels are set on the Eastern Shore, most are set in New York City and feature a plucky heroine who travels from the small town to seek her fortune, a pattern that Sophie herself followed by moving from Denton to Pittsburgh to New York City after graduating from Hood College. Her Murray Hill Brownstone became the center for Kerr's group of literary and theater friends, and its sale enriched the Sophie Kerr Prize. 
many of you know, over 40 years ago, 40 years ago, when Sophie Kerr left money to Washington College in her will, she stipulated that half of the earnings be given each year to a graduating senior who shows the most literary promise. The Sophie Kerr Prize this year, wait for it, $61,062.11. Is, we believe, the largest undergraduate literary prize in the world. She also specified that her money be spent on scholarships for promising writers, books, and campus visits by writers and scholars. As a result, over 200 well known writers, including Gwendolyn Brooks, Allen Ginsberg, Toni Morrison, Robert Pinsky, Jane Smiley, Ted Kuger, how long do you guys have? <laughs> and many others have read from their work on campus. Kerr's decision to dedicate her fortune to writers, to nurturing and encouraging young writers, has made Washington College a literary haven and is what brings us all, readers and creative writers, scholars and students of literature, here today. Thank you for joining us, and I will turn the podium over to my colleague, Bob Mooney. Thank you. Uh, it's my function and my pleasure to uh, give a formal uh, introduction to our keynote uh, speaker, uh, Colin McCann. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you all for coming uh, and celebrating, um, uh, you know, in this reception for the finalists for the 2001 Sophie Kerr Prize uh, and the notable and many talents of the student body that they represent. Uh, I'd also like to give thanks to the folks at the Poets' House. Um, it, it means a great deal to us to be welcomed so warmly uh, by consummate professionals uh, with a mission that is so admirable and necessary and, when we're at our best, so similar to our own mission at Washington College, involving people week after week to step into the living tradition of literature, one that links the writers of today with the vast literary tradition that nurtured them. We're venturing out of certain aspects of our tradition that have been part of Washington College's way of conferring the Sophie Kerr Prize in order to find an even better way to honor the larger tradition that the prize is part of and serves, preparing talented young writers for success, discovery, and empathic generosity in contributing to the literary endeavor. In fact, honoring tradition and remaining open to innovation is precisely uh, what the liberal arts tradition is about, and of which Washington College is a formidable proponent. Part of what Sophie Kerr has allowed in her generous legacy for Washington College is to bring some of the best writers of our time to campus to read and converse and work with our students. When we are at our luckiest, they are writers of the caliber of Colin McCann, who has visited Washington College twice and has made a considerable impression on the students and members of the campus and Chestertown communities. When he read at the college last September, we noted the way that Colin's stories and novels have a way of inviting us to take them personally, take them to heart, as if they were written precisely for the essential us in us that we too often forget or ignore, or at least that the world too often forgets and ignores. Column's fiction and relentless acknowledgement to the harshest realities the world shoves at us, indifference, cruelty, prejudice, demonstrates story after story that love and basic human kindness are realities too. In fact, that they are every bit as real and just as possible, not by happenstance, uh, and not by happenstance and the ways of the world, but by choice in response to them. What better model to present to our young writers apprenticing in the art? The opening scene of Colum's most recent work, the National Book Award winning novel, Let the Great World Spin, set just a few blocks from where we are right now is a journey out into the dark that his fiction maps. Fearless and generous in its readiness for discovery, sentence after sentence, page after page. As many of you know, the scene that opens the novel is a beautifully composed rendition of an actual event. The Frenchman, Philippe Petit, in a subversive act of artistry, after spending uh, six years preparing, strings a thin cable between the towers 
of the then brand new World Trade Center, 1974, and stands on the ledge preparing to walk out upon it 110 stories in the air. The watchers gathering thickly in the streets below, as Column tells it, pulled in their breath all at once. The air felt suddenly shared. The man above was a word they seemed to know, though they had not heard it before. Out he went. This is the way that it is for writers, out here in midair. Certainly for Column, and certainly it is the call heard by the five ardent hopefuls featured on stage this evening, and the many they represent in the Washington College family of letters of fellow students and generations of alums in love with the written word that loves them in return for their passionate devotion to it. Here, in midair, an infinity of sky above and the earth and everything it holds below, all of it in the writer's purview, negotiating the incisive and maddening and ever-shifting path in between, negotiating not to escape, but to engage, like the artist Daedalus taking chance after chance, risk after risk, stepping out into the air again and again into the better and deeper and more considered life. We are so pleased to have Colm stepping into our lives here yet again to work shoulder to shoulder with us on this intrepid endeavor again, bringing with him, as he always does, his beautifully reckless magic of presence and words. Colin McCann. Live up to that one. Wow. Um, Extraordinary, thank you, from, from, from one of my favorite writers and one of my favorite people, and also um, somebody who works at one of my um, now favorite colleges. Because yes, I have been um, down in Chesterton um, a couple of times, and um, I enjoyed it immensely. And um, there's sort of a, a, an enduring feeling there um, that the word matters. And uh, on, on, on both occasions, I had a chance to, um, to stop in the house, um, the O'Neill house, uh, where all the posters are, are, are on the wall from all these years and years of reading. And to walk in there and to, and to look at that and to see the, 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 the mural also on the wall is to be part of this, um, this, this living history that's sort of there um, in in the college and, and, and centered, and, and it feels right. But all these people are coming in from all sorts of different angles. So you have Morrison coming in, and you have Juno Diaz coming in, and you had Brodsky coming in, and you have um, people coming from all corners of the globe in order to, to read to these fantastic students in this, what seems to me to be an incredibly forward-looking college. And so what's really interesting about um, today is that the college sort of spreads itself outwards and comes up to New York to sort of acknowledge, uh, because New York is a sort of everywhere. New York is not just New York in itself, but New York uh, is, seems to me to, 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 to be a sort of uh, a literary everywhere for sure. To acknowledge all those people um, who have, uh, through the, the generosity of Sophie Kerr, um, been able to go down and speak with your students. And so um, there's, a, there's, there's a lovely collision of, of, of intent and movement and sort of spreading out um, of, the, of, the, of the word and, and the word all, um, belonging to, 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 to these guys here today. So I think, um, you know, in, in walking into the house and, and being able to step backward into the past, to be inside and outside at the same time, in another time, in another place, in another consciousness, is sort of the height of literary intelligence. And that's why it seems uh, appropriate to bring it here and then uh, to, sp to, to uh, spread it elsewhere. The fact that we're on the web even tonight uh, is, um, it, it, it's fantastic. So this can be watched by, maybe you have some alum in Japan or in Ireland or uh, in New York down the street or, um, or back, back, in, back in Maryland. Um, I was actually talking with your, uh, the, 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 the governor, Mr. O'Malley, um, 
uh, over the last few days, and um, and 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 he is also a, a, a big fan um, of of your college, and uh, so in many ways we're 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 connected. Um, and I'm going to want to talk to you tonight um, just a little bit uh, about the, the the literary life. Um, I've been very lucky. Uh, and in fact, when I look at these, uh, these young people here today, you know they're all 21 and 22. Uh, I remember being 21 and 22, but it was a long time ago. But I got my first literary award when I was 21. Um, in, and in that occasion, it came from, from the Irish government, um, the Irish Arts Council. And it was a significant thing that allowed me voice. Um, it, uh, it, it bought me about... Um, two years of writing time. It was a small amount of money, but I parsed it out um, as much as I could. But it did at that stage. And it was a more important award to me um, than virtually any other award that came afterwards, just purely in terms of how it enabled me to work. Um, so much is given to established artists. I think it's an extraordinary idea to give it to these people who are uh, really, they're the ones who are gonna be, um, gonna be writing for us um, tomorrow. And um, so it gave me that little, that, 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 that little thrill. It's like, ah, I can't wait, uh, it's like, like you know, 20, 30 years from now to see one of these guys, or all five of them, in fact, um, you know, in, ver in various uh, parts of the literary world, maybe even giving out um, this award, uh, which I have in my pocket, by the way. I don't know the winner, but um, I, 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 at some stage, I'm going to have to open this envelope. It's like the Oscars. <laughs> but, um, you know, to talk about the literary life, there was once um, a world in which the act of storytelling uh, or, or the art of telling a story was a truth in itself, when sort of in ancient times, the storyteller got a spot near the fire. And there's always this talk now about literature um, you know, have we let our experience fall in value? You know, does the story matter? Uh, you know, are we at the edge? Uh, do we have the pulse uh, anymore? Have we closed the doors? Have we pulled the curtains? Have we come inside too much? Um, are we afraid, in the words of, say, Emile Zola, to live out loud? Well, it seems to me that this has been the question for many, many generations, and it might have been the question um, when, when, when Sophie Kerr was around. And the answer is that it is always profoundly necessary. It's the obvious answer, because what we are engaged in here um, is the democracy of storytelling, the absolute ability to recognize that every story matters, every word matters. It crosses borders, it crosses generations, it crosses um, uh, genders, it crosses uh, all sorts of issues. And everybody has a story to tell in all sorts of different ways. And it it's actually is the absolute essence of the art of, um, uh, the, art of the democratic. So, um, one of the things that often comes up in relation to, to, to writers and, 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 and in, in relation to younger writers, of course, is that, you know, how difficult it is. And sure, it's difficult, but it's difficult to, in, in all sorts of ways. It's difficult to be a plumber, you know? It's difficult to be a carpenter. It's difficult to be a cop. It's difficult to be that taxi driver who dropped you off today, right? But, um, and all things that are truly ex excellent are as difficult as they are rare. Um, and this is what Yeats calls um, the, the excellence of difficulty. Um, so why should we write? Why should we endeavor? Why should we give these young people this, um, this fabulous award and sort of send them off um, to tell their stories of their own generation? Well, I think it is because the world is beautiful and furious and strange. And the way we live our lives these days, we tend to forget that. We tend to forget how beautiful and strange it is, and sometimes we need people to give voice to that. Because literature reminds us that life is not already written down. Um, there are infinite possibilities with how we can go. Um, it ha it, you know, people say that uh, to live one, just one life is startling enough. But to have mo so much more than one life, to be able to inhabit books, to inhabit literature, um, seems to me to be an extraordinary, infinite set of possibilities. Um, 
in literature, we can have our own life and as many other lives as we might possibly want because we have that democracy of the imagination. Um, I think good writing will always reveal um, a truth that um, is, is otherwise obscured by our obsessions um, of the particular day. Um, we all know that the only thing that's truly worth doing um, are the things that might eventually break your heart. And that goes to the essence of uh, difficulty and um, pushing yourself um, to shape the written word. Uh, these guys here uh, are in so many ways the future um, of literature and uh, they will sharpen uh, our knowledge of human activity uh, down the line. Their task and our task is defined by the power of the written word, that which will help us to hear, to make us feel and to see. That and no more, and it is everything, is the unusual gifted site where we find encouragement, meaning, consolation, desolation, fear, charm, beauty, all that we demand from life itself in those stories that get told, and perhaps also that glimpse of truth for which we had forgotten to ask. That sometimes seems to me to be the function of stories, the function of storytelling, to be a sort of living portrait uh, of ourselves. Um, and so why is it difficult to do this? Well, it seems to me that it's difficult to do it because the rewards are so incredibly outstanding. Um, I feel enormously lucky to be standing uh, up here tonight, having, you know, all those years ago, been given the generosity uh, of uh, an award that, um, you know, could have gone to any number of people and probably should have, to be honest with you. But um, it spurred me and it helped me. And, um, and I feel like, uh, you know, when I talk about the literary life, um, I have to be honest and feel like sometimes I have to pinch myself to, 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 to uh, acknowledge the fact that I can even be in a room with them, with, with, with people and have the, the privilege of trying to communicate, uh, you know, what it means uh, to see, you know, young students coming along. One of my own students today from Hunter College called me and he just got um, two of his stories published with Granta magazine. And I leapt around my house, right? <laughs> I did. I was like, I was jumping around like a prayer in an air raid. I was like going, ah. And it was, it was actually uh, more important to me that, uh, that he get published than I get some good news about, about my own writing. Um, because it was sort of an unencumbered joy. And so for these five tonight, I think we will have a sort of unencumbered joy. Because they're all winners. I, I mean, they're all... The, Everybody was here. The fact that they'd gotten to this particular place uh, is an extraordinary achievement in itself. So, I mean, I, I don't know if I have any advice for you guys. I mean, uh, I don't know. I would say, uh, you know, maybe take it, enjoy it, and do something with it that, that doesn't compute. You know, go and, uh, and live your life in a raw, sort of edgy way. Um, and discovered th these truths that 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 that, that you um, that other writers, other readers, are sort of constantly looking for, um, and uh, yeah, have fun with it, have fun with it. Now, um, am I going to introduce the writers, uh, each, each of them individually, and then and 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 then we're go we're, we're going to do it that way? Okay, great. So. Um, so each of the writers is going to g um, give a reading. So I'm going to go alphabetically uh, through through all of this. Um, but um, thank you so much for, 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 uh, for being here this evening. And, um, you know, I, I, I wish every single one of these uh, young writers the very, very, very best. The first to read, um, we have all these Irish names tonight. <laughs> it's great. It's like Dan McCluskey, Maggie Farrell. <laughs> All these things. Maggie Farrell is 22 years old. She's a drama major from um, Hatfield in Pennsylvania. Uh, she served as president of Fakespeare, very good, uh, a comedic Shakespearean troupe, um, and the Riverside Players uh, that are run by students. She got the Mary Martin Scholarship, which is awarded to a student majoring in drama who demonstrates great dedication to any area of the theatre arts. 
Um, her portfolio includes a collection of short stories about her first job and examples of her work as a playwright. I believe in one of her plays, um, I don't know what it's called, but she gave God a job in one of her plays. So um, you know, that's, that, that, that seems like the way to go, is that right? Um, and after graduation, she will be apprenticing at the Hedgerow Theatre in Media, Pennsylvania. Maggie Farrell. Hello. <laughs> um, my name is Maggie Farrell. Thank you all for coming so much. Um, I'll be reading the first page of a two-page monologue entitled The Worst Thing. Uh, the character is Susan. You want to know the worst thing about being a divorcee? Every time you try to start over, the first thing they ask about is your ex-husband. And you have to tell them. Because if you do, then you're a well-adjusted adult who's ready to trust again. But if you don't, then you're either crazy or a sad little liar. So every first date you have, you have to delve into the worst part of your life in what is usually a fruitless attempt to prove that your life doesn't suck and getting involved with you won't make their life suck. And the entire time, you'd rather be talking about literally anything else. Let's take last week, for instance. I had a date with a guy, a blind date, obviously, I mean. So I get to Gail's house and we meet. And he's cute. But of course he's cute. They're all cute before they start talking, especially to a 43-year-old divorcee. But he offers to drive to the restaurant, so we go. We pull up, he holds the door for me. We go to sit down, he pulled the chair out for me. And then we start to talk. We talk about the bread, I giggled, the tablecloth, eggplant purple, and all the other stupid stuff you try to make conversation about. Now 10 minutes go by, 10 full minutes of conversation, and I start to think I'm in the clear. The waitress comes over, he orders wine like he knows what he's doing, and never once stares at her breasts. Looks, of course, but doesn't stare. I paid attention. And then we talk about our childhood pets, and I feel safe. But then it happens. A pause in the conversation, more than a pause, a lull. The difference is distinct. I never should have let it happen, but then I can sense it coming. I can see his mouth starting to form the words, and out it pops. So Gail tells me you're recently divorced. Bitch. <laughs> I'm gonna pause in my storytelling here to share with you one thought I've been having. It's not fair to say that someone is recently divorced. Because what is recent in terms of divorce? Is it like this milk is recently expired or my daughter recently graduated so we can all excuse her going off to Paris to find herself? No because divorce is something that happens to a person and never unhappens. So saying that I'm recently divorced is like saying that your grandfather is recently dead. But rather than being able to explain all that, I can only say, uh-huh, that's true. And then it starts. He's sitting there trying to think of polite ways to ask if you're crazy, and you're sitting there trying to think of clever puns to explain your husband's many infidelities, but simultaneously illustrate that you are so over it. And the whole time you're thinking, anything but this, please God, anything but this. Well, on this particular occasion, ladies and gentlemen, I did anything but this. Thank you. Great stuff. The unheard music is always great, isn't it? When I read the rest of that story. Um, Lisa Jones is next up. Um, she's 22. Uh, she's from Fork, Maryland. And she majored in anthropology and minored in creative writing. Um, she achieved distinction as a member of Phi Beta Kappa. and was on the Dean's List every semester. Oh, that's disgraceful. <laughs> that's really disgraceful. Every semester. You mean you didn't misbehave at all? Um, she also served as a writing center consultant and worked in the Geographic Information Systems Lab. The highlight of her academic career was spending time abroad in Tanzania last spring. That's cool. We're learning about the Maasai culture and volunteering in primary schools. Um, her portfolio comprises creative nonfiction, personal essays about her experiences in Tanzania and life growing up in a small town and a portion of her thesis that focus, focuses on African immigrants in the United States. 
After finishing her classes at Washington College early in December, she put uh, her passion for international development and writing to work as the Grants and Contracts Coordinator at the International Youth Foundation in Baltimore, um, a future literary light, Lisa Jones. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from my essay on my experiences in Tanzania. While in Zanzibar, Adam and I both began to feel the pangs of home. My mouth watered at the thought of a McDonald's cheeseburger with extra pickles, and he said with a dreamy smile on his normally stoic face, when I get back to Arusha, I will go straight to cow tongue soup. On the last day of the trip, Adam came to me with a present, which he announced as a gift, a pair of simple carved wooden earrings from the market. I wondered what he had sacrificed to afford them. When we said kwaheri, goodbye, at the airport, tears rolled down the cheek of a man who had killed a lion when he was only 16 years old. Back on the mainland Tanzania, when my roommates and I called Adam in to listen to a clawing sound on the roof of our hut, which obviously stopped the moment he walked in and started again the moment he left, he laughed at us and told us to toughen up, saying, you must have strong heart. He certainly did. He shielded inside him the strength of a warrior and the heart of a child. This is the real Africa. Africa, as I have come to find while sorting through my memories, is juxtaposition come alive. It is the firm roots of tradition and the budding branches of global progress. It is a Maasai herdsman wrapped in a traditional red chuka, bearing tribal scars on his face, walking along a rural road with a cattle rod in one hand and a cell phone in the other. It is the call for global assistance mixed with self-preservation, T-shirts with American football team emblems on the backs of children who have never heard of them are subtle reminders of global citizens reaching out to Africans in need. The dedication of community locals who run the Shanga Project we visited, a nonprofit coffee plantation that gives blind, deaf, and disabled people jobs and fulfillment is a brilliant example of Africans taking progress into their own hands. Africa is the collision of worlds, a small one revolving around the family and a growing global community. It is the tapestries embroidered with Barack Obama's face, sold by vendors in a market only miles away from shepherd boys who have never heard of America. I will never know what it feels like to grow up under the glow of the Milky Way or walk miles to school in bare feet. I will never feel the searing burn of a hot metal tattoo rot on my cheeks or acquire a taste for goat meat. But I do know what it is like to have my hair braided by nine six-year-olds at once. I know what the thin air at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro tastes like. And I know that when strangers act like neighbors, anywhere can be home. I may not have been born into the ancestral pulse of the Nagoma drum, but I was lucky enough to be welcomed into it by an elderly Maasai woman who grabbed my hand and led me in the dance our ancestors began long ago. Thank you. Seems to me that you know, good writing always requires that, um, that Empathy that and and humility um, and the, the the opportunity to uh, to recognise um, that the stories of others are how we also tell the stories about ourselves. Um, one of the, the nice things about um, this award uh, seems to be how uh, how humble it, it it happens to be because we're you know we're here and we get a chance to actually uh, read the read the pieces read it, read it aloud and. Um, that, and also that was one of the nice things about the college when I went down and uh, worked a little bit with the, with the students and had a chance to, to chat with them, um, how sort of non-entitled everybody seemed to be and, um, you know, that they were, uh, they were interested in the other, which is, um, which is very, very important. Uh, Dan McCloskey, um, who is 21, uh, from Ellicott City, uh, he majored in English and minored in Spanish and creative writing. Uh, he worked for the past year as the editor-in-chief of the college's magazine of features and creative arts, The Collegian. Uh, 
and also as a technical support assistant at the campus information technology help desk. I'm going to call you to fix my computer next time around. <laughs> His uh, portfolio includes a large section of creative non-fiction manuscript uh, called Lights, which focuses on his experiences with a vision deficiency and also focuses on anxiety disorder. Uh, his portfolio also contains poems and other small non-fiction pieces, a couple of critical essays that examine specific uses of narrative and style in Shakespeare's work, not Shakespeare this time, Shakespeare's work and in modern poetry. He hopes to pursue his MFA with a focus in non-fiction. Dan McCluskey. Thank you. I'm going to read two small passages from the aforementioned Lights piece. I have an invisible illness. It leads me into walls. It gets me lost in department stores. It's cost me jobs, broken my toes, made me approach strangers instead of classmates. I have come to befriend him. He is exactly the same today as he is the day I was born. He will always be here with me, watching patiently from my optic nerve. My illness is a thief. He steals the light as it passes through my pupil and hides it away somewhere, the same place where he hides all of the cones that help me see the color red. One day I will find everything he's taken from me and use it all against him. He's anxious, too. The way he teeters back and forth makes my whole eye shake. He can't ever focus and because of this has grown quite shy. He's not all bad, though. He gets me preferred seating in theaters, exempts me from physical education courses. He's taught me to see things differently, not just without the red, not just at a closer distance, but in other ways entirely. I have learned to measure distance with sound, to test ripeness by touch. My illness has found a home within me. He is becoming family. And the next passage. Is, I am in the airport, and I have just swallowed two half milligrams of Ativan in a bathroom stall. Our flight departs in an hour. I haven't slept since the night before. I'm hoping that this helps numb the, the panic. I spend six dollars on a bottle of water and a small bag of candy, dis too distracted to realize the highway robbery of the price tag. We all wait anxiously, or at least I do. I try not to think of takeoff, being strapped into my seat and shot into the sky. I wonder if the meds will work. I wonder if I'll need them once I get to Denver. I am with a group of six, the only male. Everyone else is reading a book. Kate hates flying, too tells me she cried the last time. The last time I flew, I was about 11. We're on the runway. It's, I'm almost laughing at the amount of panic the emergency tutorials are causing me. I imagine myself trying to get the life support jacket out from under my seat, and all I can think of is submitting to certain death. I'm told not to take my iPod out yet. The plane begins to move, and I'm flipping through the pages of a sky mall, trying to distract myself from the pounding in my chest. My hands are shaking and sweaty. I'm scared of vomiting. I'm scared of being scared. I'm looking at their products. My eye catches what the magazine describes as a life-size Anubis statue. Its description is priceless. The magazine boasts, we guarantee heads will turn with this enormous, more than eight foot high masterpiece whose wow factor rivals every other statue we've produced. Paying homage to the god of admission to the underworld, our Toscano exclusive is complete with scepter and ankh. I imagine a warehouse full of a small army of these Anubis statues and a manufacturer wondering where he went wrong. For a moment, I forget I am terrified, that I am even in a plane at all, and I laugh. A little bit of me, under all the panic, still peeks through. The flight lasts two hours, and I am in a trance. I've put on my pink headphones that I thought were blue when I bought at the store, and I'm listening to Sufjan Stevens sing about Chicago serial killers and night zombies. I am able to drift in and out of sleep because I begged for the window seat. We arrive without incident. I get a coffee on the way out of the airport, and it's into Denver we go. Thank you. These guys are amazing. Um, 
no nerves at all. I'm more nervous than all of them put together. <laughs> I had a chance to meet them uh, over in, um, at the hotel on uh, Chambers Street, and we walked across. And I think probably that's what I'll remember uh, the most, just the chance to um, walk across and, 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 and watch these young people and, and, and see them move, um, you know, and, and possibly move into a whole, new, a whole new universe of thought and language. Um, I had a nice chat with um, Inslee, our next uh, reader, Inslee Smullen. She's 22. She's from Frederick, Maryland. Um, I think I know someone from Frederick, Maryland. Um, Smullen, uh, she majored in English with a minor in creative writing. She was a member of the Writers Union, a club for student writers on campus, and worked at the uh, Rose O'Neill Literary House. Uh, her portfolio includes a wide range of genres, from short stories to poetry to creative nonfiction. I like that idea that she's not um, focusing in on one thing. And can, see, and can see all the, the wider landscape. After graduation, she plans to continue her exploration of the art of writing and photography and find a job which supports her, what she calls her obsession with the written word and what I understand is her love of language. Please put your hands together for Inslee Smullen. Um, so I'm going to read a section of a creative nonfiction piece called Family and Funerals, and then follow that with a poem. The room is stuffy and hot, and everyone, even adults, is fidgeting, folding up the carelessly creased programs to make fans, and removing light jackets and cardigan sweaters that were originally intended to show some kind of modesty. Most of the women are obese, and their bra straps sneak down around their arms until, like cows swatting flies, they realize the issue and pull them back onto their blushing shoulders. A cell phone goes off. My Aunt Mickey whispers, shit, and begins dredging through her oversized designer leather purse. Cadence, Ianna, and I giggle, giving Mickey stares of feigned disapproval and silencing our own phones. The preacher is unfazed. Ralph Carey was a good man who had an undeniable thirst for God's love and the love of his family, she begins, emphasizing every few words. The audience buzzes, she continues. He enjoyed many things, but he especially enjoyed the animals on his farm, the horses and chickens, and he enjoyed hunting animals too, and preparing nutritious meals for his family, including his special soup. The three of us have to cough to cover up our laughter, and my mother, who is smiling too, pinches me hard. The poor preacher continues her eulogy, which is structured around a central metaphor of Ralph's thirst for love. The phrase is painfully ironic, and it is all too clear that she has never met or even considered the man before now. The family must have been asked to fill out some kind of character profile for the deceased, asked to cite specific information that the that the preacher could use in the final speech. Apparently, nobody had bothered to write down abusive alcoholic in the description. <laughs> and this is a poem called Early. Good morning, blackbird, with your four and 20 friendships perched on high, hawking your berry wares and predicting dandelions, the winter but a breeze passed through iridescent feathers. Even the ladybugs are dispersing their corner clusters for the other side of the window, leaving the ceiling freckled in garnet constellations that move slowly across a sky flooded with sunlight. The deer, too, are all out, necks craned like long cursive N's and R's with tails that ribbon and knot at the ends with soft V-split noses, noses that are all the time digging and touching like little bare palms pressed to earth. Their ears flick out of premature instinct, for the flies are still sleeping, shrouded in their opalescent wings, wrinkled, misshapen, not yet full of prisms of light reflected from the glint of a cow's eye or the spark of a soda can. Here, the forsythia comes early to hem the skirts of fields that fan out with hazel heather pleats in pretty yellow, the, ro the rows of fir seeds naked and ready, but the planting not yet begun. Nice. Um, it strikes me that I really should say um, thank you to the teachers. Well done. A round of applause to all the teachers, please.
the best teachers um, don't really teach, but they, they allow an intent um, and they give access to desire and stamina and perseverance, which are three of the things that, um, that, that, that all writers will have to have uh, for the length of their career. Um, so um, uh, uh, my, my kudos to everybody who has, been, uh, who has allowed this, uh, this journey for these young people. The last reader. Uh, this evening, Joseph L. L. Yates, Yates, Y-A-T-E-S. Uh, we'll claim him anyway. Uh, the Irish will claim him. He's 22 as well, and he was a double major in biology and um, studio art. He hails from Tampa, Florida. Uh, he founded and served as president of uh, both the Artists' Union, which is a club for students in the visual arts, and the Guerrilla Music Theatre Troupe. Uh, creating um, improvised song and dance performances. He worked as a consultant for the multi Multimedia Production Centre on campus and as a staff writer for the Features for, for the Collegian. Um, his portfolio of writing includes creative nonfiction that addresses both his personal life and contemporary scientific theory, several works of fiction, a smattering of poems, and one, quote, not quite children-oriented or child-oriented storybook. There's my editorial eye going through. Um, I don't know grammar at all. It's like, um, but after graduation, uh, Mr. Yates hopes to find a job as a, as a writer. I'm sure he will. Uh, we need those voices to talk to us um, about the, um, the connection of science and, and literary. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. I'm going to read um, an excerpt from an essay and a poem today. The name of the essay is uh, Nyatni as an Evolutionary Mechanism of Adaptation or How to Stay Young Forever and Love It. <clears throat> On every bough and branch of the great tree of life, as Darwin referred to it, there exist innumerable methods of adaptation and modes of survival. Nyatni is an adaptive mechanism whereby the maturation of the body as a whole is secondary to the maturation of the sex organs. Uh, in terms of the game of chance that is evolution, regarding uh, the drastic abiotic and environmental shifts that may occur, Nyatni is an ace in the hole. Let's take a look at Jeremy, for instance. Jeremy is a salamander. He swims, he eats, he reproduces, but he doesn't experience the full metamorphosis from aquatic to terrestrial that so many of his amphibian brethren seem so inclined to do. From a young age, Jeremy knew he wanted to stay young. The water column was deep, full of food. He fathered his first clutch of little Jeremy's and Jeremyettes at the age of one. Yet Jeremy lives an idyllic life. He thrived, and certainly his mother would ask why he didn't put down those silly gills like his cousin, you know, the next lake over. But mom, it's so much effort. I have everything I need right here. Jerome only left home because his options all dried up, literally. Despite his whining, Jeremy has a point. His cousin Jerome's lake had received less water the year he packed up his gills and learned to breathe air. The reduced resources and increased potential predation in the shallow water really didn't strike him as a desirable living condition, besides the staying at home with his mother part. Uh, the specific, this specific use of Nyani exhibits a distinctive phenotypic plasticity, which Jeremy tells, tells you know, more about later on in the essay that I won't get to. But, uh, and some may call Jeremy lazy, but he, you know, he eats and he has kids just fine, but he doesn't really reach his true potential. Uh, by comparison, however, he's living a hectic and fast-paced life full of responsibility when it is observed in comparison to the male bark beetle. In Southeast Asia, these guys have it made. For every generation, one male is born, which is kind of prophetic, really. Uh, and this male barely bothers to even put his pants on, developmentally speaking. And the essay goes on, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, and next I'll be reading a poem, which is, uh, as I feel like I've said the phrase too many times at this point, somewhat obtusely uh, a love poem, entitled, Reflections on the Bond Strengths of Two Similarly Charged Molecules. <laughs> the infinitesimal core of hard matter that is the heart of me will occasionally meet another. Sparks will fly, minute electrical attractions will flicker into life and flash out. Arcs of energy cutting a jagged bridge from one lonely island to another. We condense now, gas to liquid. Now liquid to solid, we freeze against the nature of freewheeling, unpredictable orbits. Our polar axes stick in place. We form partial charges, dipoles, van der Waals. Our charges spent, we lose intimacy to unsteady but growing bonds, lopsided and polarized. 
But the longer we wait, the more force necessary to twist away, to retrieve my energy, to break this bond. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, there's one winner of this award, uh, but um, I'm sure there will be many, many winners, successive winners, um, in the sense that uh, we will get to read their work um, down through the years. Um, it's hard that there's one winner, but um, th that's what it is. And uh, here we go. So, the uh, winner for this, this really is like the Oscars. <laughs> uh, the Sophie Kerr Literary Prize 2011 is 2011. Yeah. Is let me see, Lisa Jones. Congratulations, well done. Fantastic. Well, I think the fact that I haven't prepared a speech says a lot about the other candidates up here. Um, everyone is really great, and it could have been any one of us, but um, I look forward to hearing what else comes from them. I just wanted to thank all of my professors, especially um, Professor Mooney, sorry, <laughs> for just being um, really good advisors along my journey. I'd like to thank my parents who are here today um, for reading all my drafts. <laughs> and um, just anybody who I've met along life's journey that made um, true life worthy of story. So thank you all. I'd like to just take a moment and recognize all five of the students sitting here who are really wonderful writers. We cannot wait to see what they do in the future. I think you could see the talent in just the, the small excerpts we had, and I hope it whets your appetite to read what these five wonderful and brilliant writers have for us in the future. So I want to recognize all five of them. Thank you to those of us who've joined us on the web, all of you out there across the world. I'm imagining hundreds and thousands of people listening to this. Um, thank you to those of you at the, at the party at Washington College. Please raise a glass to Sophie Kerr and to these students, and we're going to do the same in just a few minutes. And thank you to everybody who's come today, and we're going to go upstairs and celebrate these five. Thank you, everyone.